world of the Bible, the 19th of February. Objectives for myself in this lesson, find what covenants are, since the Bible, since the chapter brought up that subject. Secondly, to know seven biblical covenants, whatever they are. Thirdly, to understand God's commitment to our salvation, since that's what a covenant does. And then fourthly, to remain loyal to God by faith in Jesus Christ. Remember, you can always download the document in these PowerPoint slides from our website. Right, this lesson theme seems to be expressed on page 166. Membership in God's family has only one condition, unswerving faith in the God of gods who has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. So then, what is a covenant? There's a Professor Frank Morse Cross was one of the primary names in biblical studies in the previous generation. He defined a covenant as a widespread, well known throughout the Middle East, legal means by which the duties and privileges of kinship may be extended to another individual or group, including aliens and in particular, kingship with the emperor or the king. This is the, let's unpack that a moment. It's something legal, which means a covenant can be enforced if there's someone strong enough to do so. It always includes duties, certain obligations that have to be fulfilled. For example, if an emperor conquered another country, rather than just crush it, he would make a covenant with the New little country, which then became a vassal state, and the <clears throat> vassal state, for example, may have to deliver every year one ton of silver, or so many kilograms of gold. But there were always privileges. If you remain faithful to the, em the emperor, then if another enemy came to attack you, the emperor would come to your defense. So there was a lot of protection in being conquered. And kinship, in other words, you join the family of nations. Or the vassal king may be considered now to be an adopted son of the emperor. So this is what was included in a covenant. Oh, by the way, the first half of today's session is mostly college level lecture. The uh, second half, we'll get into reading some scripture together. Oh, and then, of course, this can include aliens who are formerly strangers. This is why scripture says we formerly were aliens and strangers. So, this is biblical vocabulary. And to demonstrate whether a relative importance in scripture of this theme, I asked my free downloadable Bible study program, how often the words occur, the following words. For example, in the English Standard Version, the terms God and Lord occur over 10,000 times. Life and live, over 800. But all forms of human love, over 500 times. And the law of God, Hey, over 400. So these are important themes of Scripture. And then, of course, our response of faith and believe nearly 400 times. And then I asked, how often does the term covenant occur? And it told me 295 times. So this is no minor theme of Scripture. And obedience, obey, 168. The promises of God, 152, and our hope in him, 145, cross and crucify, which we know are major themes, 79. So, this, uh, it seems that the concept of covenant is fairly important to scripture. Now, in the mid-20th century, a number of 
ancient treaties were uncovered through archaeology in the Mesopotamian Valley. I can remember as a young believer being informed that the Hittites, who are mentioned in the Bible, had never been found in archaeology and therefore did not exist. But since the Bible talks about them, the Bible is wrong. But since then, the Hittites have been found to be a very ancient and important and a powerful civilization. They conquered other countries and formed treaties with them. These are called suzerainty treaties because the Hittites would be the suzerain, that is, potentate or emperor. But it's only an emperor if you have expressly formed an empire. So these, some of these date from the second millennium BCE, especially compared with the book of Deuteronomy. And so when was the origin of the book of Deuteronomy? Conservative dating says, well, then second millennium BC. The dating fits, and so does the very structure of the book of Deuteronomy, which starts out with a title, a preamble, what this is about, and then as did the, these treaties. Of course, you see an example of part of a treaty that was probably pressed into wet clay, and then a historical prologue. So Deuteronomy, first three chapters, is a review of God's dealings with Israel over several centuries. And then general stipulations. Meaning, for example, this or that state will remain faithful to or in subjection to the king of the Hittites and will come to the defense of the Hittites if asked to do so, that kind of thing. But then very specific stipulations. How many tons of gold each year? What you will do to maintain the peace of your city or your country? right down to a number of laws, how to distribute inheritances, who marry whom, and so forth. Sometimes hundreds of laws, many of which sound very biblical. Isn't that interesting that the Spirit of God was working in the pagans, thinking Yahweh God had given orders to the lesser gods whom he had put in charge of the pagan nations, and some of them did a pretty good job of imposing divine rule over the nations. Others failed miserably. And then <clears throat> dual sanctions, that is to say, a number of blessings and curses. If you abide by this covenant, here's what the king will do for you. Protection, prosperity, representation, opportunities, business dealings, but then the curses. You will be impaled on a stake in a public place if you violate this. Or you will increase the tribute you must pay. And so right there in Deuteronomy, every year the Israelites were to stand on two mountains, shout back and forth to each other the blessings and the curses of God's covenant that he had made with Israel. Then there were instructions for the storage and the reading of the covenant document. Copies will be made, they will be put, placed into jars, hidden in caves in some cases, otherwise will be chiseled into stone in a prominent place in each country in several languages. And then there's the invocation of witnesses. Human witnesses, spirit witnesses, the gods themselves are invoked to take note of this, and uh, which sometimes would include the making of a sacrifice, and then it would be put in stipulation, though the, the national leader who violates this covenant, I will tear his head off just as we tore the head off our sacrifice. Now, um, the Lord has been dealing with us humans down through the centuries are basically in a covenant relationship. This is Galen's uh, review. You won't find this in any scholarly literature. 
or Bible notes. But just, I was just observing that. First, God chooses a people whom he loves. Is there any biblical evidence of that? Sure. Well, you can think of several texts. How that it was I who chose you. You were not looking for me. And then he proposes a covenant with that people. So, for example, Yahweh invited Moses up on the mountain. He said, I'm going to make a covenant and uh, take it back down, show it to the people, read it to them, and ask if they will abide by it. Thirdly, he specifies both promises and warnings. I promise you benefits, protection, prosperity, good health, large herds, peace with your neighbors, uh, land flowing with milk and honey, and so forth. And other warnings such as, I will send you out of the land, you will be decimated by your enemies, uh, I will curse you, and become slaves to your neighbors. As long as you're obedient, you will never be in debt to them. They'll be in debt to you. And fourthly, the humans then must square allegiance. And at the same time, by forsaking other gods. So this is an essential part of the covenant of God with both Old and New Testament believers. We must forsake the gods that we used to believe in, that we used to follow. Then humans must ratify the covenant with a sacrifice. So, for example, in the Old Testament, with the giving of the Mosaic Covenant, sacrifices were made, and then the blood of the animals was sprinkled upon the people, upon the copy of the covenant itself, upon the sacred space in which they met with Yahweh, reason for which the scripture says, Without the sprinkling of blood, there is no forgiveness. Sixthly, God then occasionally renews the covenant with the offspring or descendants of those who first received the covenant. We'll look at some of that in a moment. Seventhly, humans show loyalty to God by seeking to obey His commandments. Interestingly, in our Christian Sunday schools, we often teach the commandments of the Mosaic Covenant, never really teaching our children the commandments of Jesus that are in force under the New Covenant. God then protects and provides for his loyal subjects. Anyway, humans who rebel return under lesser gods. You cannot violate Yahweh's covenant and stay independent and free. You will always fall under the oppression of the old gods. They're still around. They've not yet been removed from the heavens. They've been disempowered for those who have faith in Jesus Christ, but they're waiting for you, or any of us, to step out of line and begin oppressing us again. Number 10, God invites rebels to repent and to return to him. He does not destroy us straight away. He really wants us to return, get back under the covenant where we belong, and enjoy his protection. But then he occasionally poses a new, better covenant with better sacrifices. And, to the praise of God, some humans do repent, they do believe, and they do persevere. They stay in the covenant. God adopts the faithful into his royal family. We're not just left out there on our own with his covenant to guide or threaten us. But rather, he makes us his own dear children by adoption. And finally, God exalts the faithful and destroys the rebellious. Because he was, what's his purpose through all of history? What is he seeking to do? What kind of responses we can might listen to, we might hear. What's all of this trouble we're going through? What's it all about? Leading up to something. To glorify himself by drawing people to himself. That theologically, that's it. Historically, what is he seeking to do? 
To restore Eden. To restore Eden. He had set up the earth as Eden, where he could dwell with both spirit beings and beings, all at the same time. But with the fall of Satan, who then entailed the fall of human beings, we were excluded from the garden situation, that is, of intimacy with God, and he placed us under lesser beings and called to himself Israel, through whom he would eventually invite the nations back to himself, and upon the return of Messiah, will establish the entire earth once again as Eden. Most theologians I've looked at agree that there are as many as seven biblical covenants. I call them the biblical covenants because theologians often invent other covenants that are not explicit in the Bible because they need it to defend their system. They might be right. We'll look at the biblical ones. All right, there was the, the one with Noah. A, God, a covenant God made with Noah and with all humanity. Why did I not say Adam here? First, there is no covenant mentioned explicitly in Scripture regarding Adam and the early race. But rather, with they, Adam was created in fellowship with God. He needed no covenant. That's the way I take it. But with Noah and humanity, we have the first explicit mention of covenant. And here's what it concluded. Someone read verse 1. If you fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. All right? That's a stipulation. That's the human part, which, by the way, is not difficult. <coughs> Alright, verse 3. And it moves and moves about. Right. So, a new provision is made. Uh, the agriculture will not be sufficient to meet the needs anymore. It may have something to do with extending the curse across the earth. Verse 9. I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. Uh, here's the mention of covenant. So we, no question is left for the reader, at least the Middle Eastern reader, as to what God is doing. You and your descendants. So this is something that continues. In fact, Judaism, they not only have 613 laws for themselves, but they have a set of laws for Gentiles. Have you heard them? They're called the Noahide laws. Part of the obligation of Judaism is to enforce those laws on the rest of us. They all happen to be biblical, and they come right out of the Noahic covenant. And 11. Never again will I, we all life be destroyed by the water. Right. Do folk ever drown in floods to this day? Unfortunately, it's true. But has the entire earth ever been covered in a flood since? All right, let's look at the second one. This is the a, a covenant that Yahweh made with Abraham and his offspring. Chapter 12, God met Abraham, gave him the promise that he would become a blessing to the entire world. And Abraham believed it. And so Yahweh counted that faith as righteousness. Now that he is righteous before Yahweh, Yahweh forms a covenant. Verse 1. I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Any observations? God is the one who takes the initiative in all the covenants. All right. It's not like man comes up with the idea. Yeah, yeah. No one comes to God and says, I have a covenant, <laughs> Lord, I'd like you to sign on here. <laughs> okay. Well, stipulation two, uh, before me faithfully and be blameless. Right. Keep the faith. Uh, there was no law yet, so how could he violate it? Boy, if you violate the law of God, but since he hadn't revealed it yet, Scripture says that it's not held to be sin. The human response to divine covenant is just stay faithful to Yahweh, blamelessly. Don't play with other gods. Verse 5. 
Her name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. Uh, when Yahweh changes somebody's name, what in essence is Yahweh doing to the individual? Changing them too. Change of what? Changing them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Definitely should change them. Yes. Change the name with many blessings. Yes. Part of the adoption process? Good observation. When you adopt a child, generally uh, you change its name, depending on the society. Now, Jennifer and I have lived in countries where, for example, a wife always retains her family's name, not her husband's name. Although in polite circles she could be called a madame so and so. Never say, oh, this is Aminata, so and so, using the husband's name. Anyway, the change to name of a person or a place always implies ownership. There's a change of honor <coughs> here reflected in the change of name. And verse 10 Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo <coughs> circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant. Thank you. Lots of questions around this practice. Since uh, Moses came out of Egypt, as well as Israel, all the Israelites came out of Egypt, circumcision was a practice in Egyptian religion. And it was primarily the priests who were circumcised. And so when Yahweh circumcised the entire nation, to them, he was making them a nation full of priests. It also had something to do with making descendants. Let's look at another one. Moses and the Israelites in Exodus before their arrival in Canaan. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And remember that God, what God had done with all the other nations, he had placed them under lesser gods. And he, but he said, I will make, keep Israel as my own. Stay my own, they must be faithful to me. Okay. Eight. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. Yeah, so when Moses explained the new covenant to the Israelites as a, through their representatives, probably the family leaders, the clan leaders, the tribal leaders, they got together and expressed on behalf of the entire population, yes, we will do everything that Yahweh has saved for us to do. You think they meant it? They might have meant it, but they didn't, but they didn't deliver it. Now, fourthly, there is a covenant made with Phineas and Levi, which for some reason theologians and preachers never deal with. Yes. Phineas, I am making my covenant of peace with him. Covenant of a lasting priesthood, because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement. Now, we don't want to mention in public <clears throat> How Phineas pleased Yahweh. Let the uh, picture suffice. And go look it up in the Bible. But then when we come to Malachi, we have this. My covenant with Levi may continue. A covenant of life and peace. You walk with me in peace and uprightness and turn many from sin. He, probably referring back to Phineas, because Phineas was a descendant of Aaron and the father of Levi, who the tribe that became the Levites, uh, the priestly class of Israel. In any event, it's, it's there. This way, the covenant Yahweh made with Moses and the Israelites in Canaan after their arrival, which included the entire book of Deuteronomy. But some excerpts therefrom. Remember the Lord your God. But it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Right. So when our Jewish friends and neighbors succeed financially, 
We shouldn't blame them. Blame their God. <laughs> Go for your gift. You're saying Moses and Israelites in Canaan. So right. I didn't think Moses made it to Canaan. No, he didn't. So, uh, uh, Moses formed the, the covenant before they got into Canaan, but the covenant applies to Canaan. Uh, the previous covenant sufficed for 40 years, sort of, but now entering the land, the main stipulations and promises of the Sinai covenant, so we call it, are repeated in a much fuller form, which includes urban life. If you ever forget Yahweh, your God, and follow other gods, and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Same stipulation applies. Just stay faithful to Yahweh. Whatever other religions offer you, Yahweh will do it better. Although it may not be as instantaneously pleasurable. Then there was this covenant with David and his offspring. From Psalm 89. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your mind forever and make your throne firm through all generations. All right, so there was to be a Davidic lineage right on down through the centuries. How far did that go, by the way? How long did it last? 2,000 years or more? Well, at least, yes. After the destruction of the temple, let's see, got this problem. Who was the last king of Israel? Jesus. Isn't he gone? Didn't they kill him? <laughs> but he seated at the right hand of the Father. He seated at the right hand of the Father, and so the Davidic lineage is still in power to this day. We'll need to look for another one. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness to in the assembly of the holy ones. Uh, in the, this psalm, David was talking about how Yahweh had made these promises, formed a covenant with him and his family, but then he mentions the assembly of the holy ones. Why is that important to the Davidic covenant? To we'll talk about the spirit beings who reside in the, the heavens or the skies. They're with Jesus. <coughs> Say it again. They're telling us they're up there with Jesus. It's well, still going on. Uh, yeah, that's true. Now, the lesser gods, they're still influencing the nations to this day. And they're struggling right now to impose a new world government across all the nations. It's not Klaus Schwab. That man, frankly, isn't smart enough. <laughs> or is Bill Gates ethical enough? But several billionaires together could probably pull it off. But in any event, they are being driven by the fallen gods who now have their last chance to regain rule over the earth just before Yahweh returns. But it will be a descendant of David whose kingship will eventually extend throughout the entire earth and finally disempower and remove the spirit beings, who as a general class belong to the holy ones. Not that they're holy in character, but they're holy in finally given text. The new covenant that was promised through by Yahweh through Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. So, all right, a new covenant is coming up. Here are some pieces of it. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This was an amazing uh, statement when it was given because uh, throughout the history of Israel, they were making daily, weekly, monthly, and annual sacrifices because of the problem of sin. In order for Yahweh to continue to dwell in their midst, he needed a sacred place. 
and that sacred place was limited to a tabernacle. And the tabernacle had to be cleansed every year because the whole nation had become defiled by their sins, uncleanness and so forth. But he said, a time is coming when I'm not going to be concerned about that anymore. Sin will no longer be an issue between you and me. Your good performance will not be what wins my favor towards you, nor will your bad performance in any way diminish my favor towards you. What has become of this new covenant? There were several mentions in the covenants of what happens to covenant breakers. What's that guy doing there, staring at a hat? Who that is? Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith. He was an apostate. He left the community of Christ, and he declared himself to be a prophet. And what does he have in the hat? Golden plates. And when I look at the golden plates uh, and put on my special glasses, I can then see what crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. In Genesis, there was a requirement that those in the covenant with Yahweh must circumcise all of their males. For anyone coming into Israel to worship at Yahweh, had to go through the circumcision rites. They're declaring themselves to be members of the nation of priests. Then Leviticus, there was just general breaking bad or doing particular sins that are mentioned, most of which have to do with reproduction. And why is that? Think it for a moment. The first covenant, the stipulation of the first covenant, was that be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Have children. Nearly all of the evil mentioned in the Mosaic Law has to do with violation of reproduction and family unity. That's what makes queerdom so evil. It is a direct, not only violation, but contradiction mm -hmm. of the commandment of God. Then they, right, of course, the worship of false gods, <clears throat> now the real gods who happen to be less than Yahweh. And then straight out forsaking of Yahweh himself. Then there was something called ancestral iniquity, that the sins of the fathers that are visited onto the children means that subsequent generations not only suffer from the consequences of their father's sins, they tend to repeat them. And then in Hebrew 6.6, 6, we have the really sad phenomenon of Christians who deny Christ. Those who have once been enlightened, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. Uh, we're not going to discuss the theology of whether these were elect or non-elect, or regenerate or non-regenerate. The point is, these were Christians who had had some share in the Holy Spirit. They had actually received the Spirit. They were baptized Christians, Christians at least in a sociological sense, but they had fallen away, forsaking and actually insulting the blood of the covenant. When we say fallen away, does that mean they lost their salvation and won't go to heaven? That's well, what I don't. Mean. It doesn't matter what I mean. Okay. <laughs> that was the, I think the teaching is. Well, it depends on which theologian you ask. Okay. <laughs> I suspect, just from Scripture, that those who consciously, willfully, decidedly abandon Jesus Christ, never go. They, mm -hmm. never, they do not make it to heaven. Christians under the New Covenant, what does this imply for you and me who remain faithful to Jesus? Well, first, he said he has inaugurated the New Covenant that Jeremiah had foretold. And he did it with his own blood, not with the blood of bulls, goats, sheep, or birds. Here's what he said. This cup is the New Covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Remember that every time you take communion and you drink of the cup, 
you are asserting that you are a member of the new covenant community and that this covenant has been inaugurated, it was started, initiated by the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And secondly, Israel and Judah are united anew by faith in Messiah Jesus. Remember Jeremiah had said the new covenant would be made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the nation that had been split in two. But on the day of Pentecost, the observation is made that here are Jews who have gathered from every nation. So there were the Israelites, there were the Judites, and they had come together. Many of them heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the very first day, 2,000 of them went to the mikvah to declare themselves followers of Jesus, continue to do so to this day. There's still more to be done historically, but the new covenant provision has begun to be fulfilled. Thirdly, Gentiles are adopted by faith into Abraham's family in the Lord Jesus. It's not that God had a first program for Israel and then made up a second program for the rest of us. No, we had only one program. That was for Israel. We are invited to be adopted into Abraham's family and thereby become children, inheritors of Yahweh himself. When you see a great Jewish celebration going on someplace, Messianic congregation is dancing with costumes and so forth. You'd really say, hey, that looks really fun. Why is our church so boring? <laughs> <laughs> Remember, well, you really are a born again child of God, a child of Abraham. And then we who believe in him have become God's adopted children. Oh, there's more. God promises everlasting life to us who remain loyal to Jesus Christ, or Messiah, Jesus. This is what he said. This is what he promised to us, everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Stay loyal to Jesus. Jesus asks us to show our love for him by obeying his commandments. Salvation? No, we've already got that. Members of the family? No, we're already members of the family. That's the only way we can show our love to Jesus, is by obeying his commands. Thank you, Aaron. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. And seventhly, we who believe, we find ways to invite others to put their faith in Jesus. It's easier to do, by the way, in a team or in a, as a house group than by an individual going out and saying insulting religious things to people who don't want to hear it. And eighthly, those who remain loyal will dwell forever in the restored Eden, when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven to rule over the entire earth. But there's more. Those who disbelieve fall under the jurisdiction of lesser gods. One does not leave Yahweh and his Messiah Jesus and become an independent uh, operator. Tenthly, disbelievers will follow the lesser gods into the lake of fire. Did Jesus say in Matthew? Part for me, cursed into the eternal fire, prepared to the devil and his angels. Which is extremely sad.